Okay, so we are going to talk about sorting here today. And sorting is really nice because we like to see things in some sort of order, either alphabetical or numeric order. And um, there's a ton of sorting algorithms out there. Now, I'm not going to go through the code for each one of these because going through the code is somewhat boring. Also, there's a million different versions of it already out on the web anyway. You should not, that does not mean you should skip reading about the code and looking at it to see why it works. But I'm more um, emphasizing how the sorting algorithms are working in the first place. And when we talk about sorting algorithms, so if we have, for example, this set of numbers and we want to put them in ascending order numerically, there's two things we need to do. We're going to have two different kinds of operations. We're going to have to do a comparison to see if things are in the right order or not. And if they're not in the right order, then we're going to have to exchange or move them. So whenever we have some sorting algorithm, what we really want to do is we want to measure its efficiency by how many comparisons it's going to need and also the number of exchanges or moving things that it's going to need. So those are the two things that we want to concentrate on when we decide, is this a good algorithm or not? Now, for anything that's less than maybe six or seven items, frankly, it doesn't matter what you use. Um, in fact, the simpler ones are probably the better ones because the more complicated ones that got a lot of overhead, which you don't want to have to deal with. But when we get into lists of, let's say, 10,000 or 20,000 items or even 1,000 items, then the choice of your algorithm makes an enormous difference. Now, I don't know how many of you uh, were, did some research on this on your own, but there's a lot of animations out there. If you want to see animations for sorting algorithms, this and this one here, I mean, is really pretty nice, actually. If you want to see the general flow of how things work, this one's really good. Move this over to there. So for example, if I want to have a random bunch of things and I want to see how the shell sort works, I can play the animation and it shows you how, the, how it's working, but there's no details on there. You say, well, gee, that's a great animation, but what was really actually going on behind the scenes? But again, if you want to see the general flow of how things are moving around, this is a really nice page. If you want to see what's going on step by step, this page here, which is the second one that I brought up here, is really good. And that's what I'm going to be using today to show you most of these algorithms. And thank goodness this person wrote them because otherwise I would have had to write a, written it myself. So let's start off with the conceptually simplest, but unfortunately one of the least efficient sorts, which is the bubble sort. And we're going to arrange these bars by height. Um, so let's step through this one step at a time. The nice thing about this is as it does each thing, it gives you an explanation down here of what's happening. Yeah. So we're going to put the largest item is going to bubble up to position 16. So we want this largest one to be there. So how do we start? First of all, we compare one and two. One is bigger, so that means we have to swap them. I'm going to make this fast so that we don't have to see the animation going like that. Now, we compare two against three. Okay, are they in the right order? No, they aren't, which means we have to swap those. Then three against four. Okay, they're in the correct position. We don't have to swap. Four is bigger than five. Yes, we swap them. Five against six, have to swap. Six and seven are in the correct order. Seven and eight aren't, so we swap them. Eight and nine aren't, and so we go all the way through that, and that's pass number one. So by the time we're done, it sounds like the largest item is going to bubble up to the top of the, the end of the list. It's like a bubble rising in a column of water. That's why they call it the bubble sword. Great. Now we know going to get now we know that the largest bar is right where it belongs. What we're now going to do is we're going to take the remaining numbers and go through this all over again. One against two, they're in the wrong order. Two against three, 
Okay, these are in the wrong order. These are in the correct order, correct order, correct order, nothing to do. Oh, we got to swap those. And then these are in the right order, right order, wrong order, correct order, wrong order, wrong order. And now once we're done with that pass, we're where we belong. Is everybody I, I clear on the idea here? And then we're going to have to do this for all of the numbers one through four, one through 14, then one through 13, and then one through 12, and so on. And I guess I'll just do a quick so on run here. And you can notice it's kind of counting how many comparisons and how many copies it had to make of the data to switch them around. And this is effectively doing the same thing that at the other web page I was showing you, but now you understand what's going on because you can step through it one at a time. This is not tremendously efficient, has a lot of comparisons and a lot of copies. I guess I may as well show the code. Could, couldn't hurt. Um, the bubble, sorry, there it is. Yep. Essentially, it's a doubly nested loop. Uh, this one is going in the reverse direction. It's starting and from the, it's putting, I think, the smallest one at the beginning. But we're going to scan from zero to N. And then we're going to go up to, from zero up to the one that we're, oh, no, yeah, this, no, this is the correct one. This is where we're going to stop. And we're going to go from zero up to the stopping point, And then we're going to compare list J and um, and the one next to it. And if they are in the wrong order, we have to swap them. And this is an expensive process. So swapping things around is, is expensive because we have to do a lot of accessing. We have to access the first one, then we have to access the second one, put it where the first one is, and then access the temporary and put it there. So there's a lot of moving and copying around and exchange things. And we... I guess I should point this out. I think we've done, you might've seen this when you were in computer science 75, but if I wanna swap A and B, let's say I have int A and int B, I can't say A becomes B and B becomes A. That is not going to do the trick. That's going to fail. Why? Because let's say I have, is everybody clear why this, why this does not work? Okay. And that's why we need that temporary. We have to take B and save it into C. And now that we've saved B, now we can overwrite it. And then we can, um, so we have to do that. So there's your bubble sort. Um, because we have a doubly nested loop, this is an order n squared algorithm. So the bad news is it's not terribly efficient. The good news is it's very straightforward to implement and understand. One other good thing about the bubble sort is if I go through a, one of my passes and I don't have to do any swaps, then I know that the whole thing is must be in order. So I can exit early. None of the other sorts give you this advantage, but bubble sort does. If I go through one of the passes and I didn't have to put anything, they must have all been in the correct order anyway, and off I go. Um, should I tell you about this? Yeah, I'm gonna, I gotta tell you this story. This is back at the University of Illinois. I was one of the, we had graders, okay, because of these were huge lectures, like 200 people. And I was one of the graders for Computer Science 101. We had a whole bunch of us. And Martin Green, I think his name was Martin Greenberg. Martin and I were in the graders room and we were talking about the bubble sort, and he accidentally mispronounces the bumble sort. Okay. And so we came up with this, with this wonderful non algorithm. Here's what it is uh, choose two elements of the list at random, exchange them, okay? and do that while the list is not in order. <laughs> so just pick two. Swap them and then see if the list is in order. If it is, you're done. If it's not, pick another two at random and swap them. This is not an algorithm because there's no guarantee that it will ever end. 
its performance gets incredibly worse the more items you have. And the worst possible case is when you have a list that's already completely in order. Because the very first thing it does is it swaps them and then checks to see if it's in order or not. So if you have something that's already sorted, it will immediately undo the correct answer. So we had a lot of fun developing the bumble sort. Okay? So I'm quite sure that is much more inefficient than the bubble sort. But I just had to pass that one on to you. Okay, okay back to sorting algorithms that are actually worth a damn, <laughs> unlike the bumble sort. So bubble sort is, is good. There's nothing wrong with it. And if I would have had, let's say, only five items, I could I could afford the inefficiency. For a thousand items, not so much. The next step up is something called the selection sort. And this time, when we are going to do this, we're going to make only one exchange for every pass through the list. So what we're going to do, let's come back here. And let's go to selection sort. I'm going to, and here's what we're, how, how it works. What we're going to do is we're going to look for the largest one. We're not going to do any swapping until we find the largest one. So the, my maximum is the first item so far. Nope, that's smaller, 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 smaller. All of these are smaller. Oh, and now I've got a new maximum because that's bigger than the one that used to be my maximum. And now I've found yet another maximum. And finally, when I get to the end, I haven't found anything bigger than that. And now I do one swap only. Instead of having to swap many, many times as I do the pass, I find the biggest one and then put it where it belongs. Now I go through again and find, okay, what's the smallest one in the remaining list? And again, I look for my maximum. That looks like it's going to be it. And since I found my maximum, that goes into position 15. I do only one swap per pass. And see, the number of copies here is very, is very small now as opposed to the bubble sort where it was a really big number. And then again, what's the largest one remaining? And that will go in position 14. And we keep doing that, finding whatever is the largest one in the remaining bunch and putting it where it belongs. So we're selecting the largest and putting it at the end of the list. Does this sort of make sense with the, how this is working? Do you want me to go through this one again or not? Okay. And then if we run the thing, This is also order n squared. Um, however, again, it's a lot more efficient because look at the number of copies we have as opposed to the, and the comparisons. In fact, let's do this here. This is a really great page. Let's have one array of length 1000 here. And let's do a bubble sort and run it. And you'll notice that it's had a th this many comparisons and that many copies. Whereas if I say, let's use a selection sort and run it, notice that's a lot less time and it has the same number of comparisons, but the number of copies is much, much less. And that's why it's a lot faster than the bubble sort. So selection sort is one step up from bubble sort and it's pretty good. Yeah, I, I can't complain about its um, performance. I guess it would be good to look at the um, code here. Now, this one is moving the minimum index instead of the maximum one. So it's taking the, the smallest one and moving it to the beginning, as opposed to taking the largest one and moving it to the end. But that's the same effect. We're just doing it. We're, we're growing the list from the beginning to the end instead of the, from the end of the beginning. And what I do is, here's the item that I have, and here's my minimum index. And then if the list sub j is less than the list at the minimum index, then that becomes the index of my minimum item. 
I'm not storing the item itself. I'm just storing where I found it. And then if the minimum index isn't the one I'm looking at, I swap it with the position that I'm looking for. So that's effectively the same thing that you saw in that animation, only I'm putting the smallest ones in order rather than the largest ones. I guess I could fix it to do it the way the animation does, but this is the way the book has it, so I'll leave it that way. Yeah, not too much to think about here. Yeah, it's order n squared, and it's fairly straightforward to implement, and it's also reasonably um, straightforward to understand as well. Okay, next one, the insertion sort. Now, this is, again, one step up from selection sort. And let's make a new bunch of things here. Now, here's how this one works. What we want to do is we're going to have a bunch of sub lists. And the sub list, we're going to put things in. We're going to insert things into a sub list where they belong. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Let's just see it in action. I think that will make it a lot easier to understand what's going on. Yeah. So we have a one sublist in the box. It's correctly sorted. When I have one item, one item is always sorted properly. There's nothing to compare it against. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at insert item number two into its correct position. So I'm going to take item two and I'm going to copy it into a temporary area, which will free up this space. So now I have a space where I can move things into in case I need extra room. Mm -hmm. Items one through two now form a sorted list. Fine. Now we need item three in its correct position. We're going to copy that to the temporary area. Okay. Is item two bigger than this one? Well, if it is, then that means that this guy here has to go before this one, doesn't it? Do you need me to say that again? Okay. Let's say this one is a four, a six, and a five. Yeah. Since five won't go into this position, otherwise we'd be out of order, correct? Are you with me on that? Yeah. It, so that means that this two, the, the five here, has to, this guy here has to go in between these two here. Yes? So what we're going to do is we're going to move this item to the empty space. Now we're going to say, okay, is this now, the one that we're looking at, is it now in the proper position? The answer is yes, because it's bigger than the one we were looking at before it. And that means it moves in there and the temporary moves in there. Yeah. Now what we need to do is we need to figure out where item four goes in the list. We move it into the temporary area, and that gives us an extra space where we can move things around. Three versus four. Okay, it turns out that this one is smaller than that, which means we have to move the empty space. Now we're going to compare this one and this one. This one's bigger, which means this is where it belongs in the list. And now these first four are all, all sorted. Now, where does number five go? We'll copy it to the temporary area. Is it bigger than this? Yes, it is. So it goes back into position five. We don't have to do any moving because it's already in the same relative position where it belongs. Now we're going to copy item six and we're going to say, where does it belong? Well, it certainly belongs before item five because it's smaller than item five. That means we have to move item five up to where six was. Now, should this go in item in position five? No, because it's smaller than what's in position four. That means we have to move position four upwards. Does it belong here between these two? No, it's smaller, so it can't, that, that's not its position, which means we have to move item number three. Smaller than item two, which means we have to add that, remove that. 
is smaller than item one, which means the empty space now moves down to here. And that's the only place that's left over. And that's where it goes. So we're doing, instead of exchanging things, we're pushing things to the right or to the, well, in this case, to the right, to make room for where the candidate is supposed to really go. Let's do one more here. And let's put item seven. So item seven is less than item six, which means that item six has to go above this. We'll push it over. Eh? Is five bigger than 10? No, that means this is where it really belongs. And we move it in and now this sub list is sorted. So every time we're gonna extend the list length by one and we're gonna figure out where to put things. And then if we run this thing, So there's your insertion story that says, okay, where does this thing belong? And I'll push everything to the right until I find the place I need it. And then it goes in at its proper position. Yeah. Notice there's not, not a lot of comparisons and there's not a lot, but there, but there are a lot of copies. Um, let's run the insertion sort on this for that thousand items. And you'll notice that there's a much many fewer comparisons than for the selection sort, but there are a lot more items being moved. So, and this immediately says, wait a minute, if there's that many items being moved, how come it's not a, how come it's more efficient than the selection sort? And the answer is because moving something from position A to position B is not as much expense as exchanging the things at position A and B. When I've exchanged things at position A and B, I have to grab A, grab B, put B, put A. When I'm moving something from position X to position Y, it's a grab and put. Only two things I have to do rather than four or five things to do. And that's why even though we have a lot of copying going on, those copies are not as expensive as the exchanges are in the um, selection sort. And that's why we have a, um, if I were to do this, let's say with the 10,000 on the insertion sort, I get 0 0.336. If I use a selection sort on 10,000, it's a little bit worse. Again, this is another N squared algorithm, but it's, it's, it's rather nice. It, it works quite well. I mean, there's a whole branch of computer science with people who are trying to figure out better sort algorithms. And let's look at the insertion sort here. This is why I'm showing you this stuff on that web page, by the way, is because you look at this diagram and it really doesn't make a hell of a lot of sense of what's going on. Um, This is really, really interesting, by the way, that the code itself for the insertion sort is very compact. There's not a heck of a lot that it has to do. You don't have to say a lot to get this. And the key of it here is this compound condition makes everything work out really nicely. That's what makes it so compact. So as long as I haven't hit the end, the, the left end of the list and the list item that I have is bigger than the value, then I'm going to move it forward and then go one step to the left. And as soon as this loop breaks, either I've found the correct position or I'm at the left end of the list and that's where the value goes in. So in terms of amount of code, this is really... I really like the insertion. I, I started out hating the insertion sort because of the, like all this moving sounded really inefficient. But the fact that moves are faster than exchanges and also the code itself is like next to nothing. Like, dang, this is cool. 
Now, the next one, there's no animation for it, unfortunately. And it's called The Shell Sort. And it's named after a guy named Donald Shell, the guy who invented it. Um, and what it does is it's going to break the original list into sublists, and you're going to sort each of the sublists. Okay. So we're going to have a gap. And I think, you know what? Let me do this. Um, I'm going to have to. Let me go to the video here and stop sharing. Um, okay, I need to, actually I need to see, see what, so I've got to adjust the camera here. Right, now let me go down to here. And I need to get these numbers here. So I'm going to have 54. Twenty six. Um, sorry, this my I, I have I see. Let me make this large enough so I can see what the hell I'm doing here. There we go. Uh, Ninety three. Uh, this is supposed to be green, but it's it, it looks like a, hold on, let me try and find a different color here. I'm gonna pause the recording for a moment here. Okay. So the idea behind this is that we're going to sort each of these subgroups of three by using an insertion sort. Um, hold on, I, this should be a 17 here, sorry about that. So it turns out that if we do this, this is already sorted it looks like. And 54. Okay. Now we're going to sort these ones in black, the 22, 77, and 50, 26, 77, and 55. And those are going to sort out into 26. This becomes 55, and the 77 goes there. And then we're going to sort the ones in green here, which will give us the 20, 31, and 93. So we've done an insertion sort on each of the sublists. Then what we're going to do is we're going to now do another insertion sort and we're going to do the insertion sort with a gap. So this is like with a gap of three. So there's three items. Every third item essentially is, is a sublist. Then what we do is we go down to one. And it turns out that once we do it with a gap of one, that gives us everything in order. 17, 20, 26, uh, 31, 44, 54, 55, 77, and 93. And, and the question is, well, if you're doing an insertion list, isn't this going to be a lot more inefficient? The answer is no, because if you look at this, you'll see that these three are pretty much nearly in order. There's more of this stuff. In fact, these three are all already in the correct order. So what it's doing is it's grouping things together and it's giving you things that are more in order than they used to be. And that means that when you do your final insertion sort, you don't have to do a lot of moving. There's not a lot of copying left to be done. The shell sort has done, a, each of the sublist sorts are getting things into sort of more order. And I can't give you a mathematical definition of why this happens, but that's what is, that's what's going on. So what we're doing is we're taking sublists and we're sorting them out. Notice this one, by the way, this first one that we had, the 1744 and 54, there was nothing that had to happen for that one. So it turns out that the number of um, comparisons and the number of 
moves that you have to do turns out on the for the most part to be less than if you had a just plain old insertion sort. It looks like it should be really inefficient, but it isn't. And that again is because of the partial grouping effect. Uh, let me share the screen again. Yeah. And the code that they give here is, um, what we're going to do is we're going to take half the length of the list and that will become our sublist. So let's say I had um, 16 items. Then I'd have sublists of eight and I would sort those. Then I would go down to sublists of four and then redo the sort. Then I'd go into a sublist of two. So every time I do this, I'm going to have the gap is going to be half as much. And here's the insertion sort for a gap of length n. And it's essentially the same thing that we had before in the insertion sort, except now instead of going by increments of one, I'm going by increments of whatever the gap number is. In fact, if you look at this and you were to run the point, run the sort, this was starting th this with increments of size four. Notice that things tend to be fairly clustered together rather nicely. After increments of size two, things are even more closely in order. And then our last one is increments of size one. Um, it says here, it falls between order n and order n squared. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you change the increment, then it can perform at order of n to the um, to the one and a half power. Now, this is one of these things where we say, okay, what is our um, breakpoint here? Okay, now what we're doing is we're trading a bit of complexity in terms of understanding the algorithm and the amount of code that we need for the straightforwardness of the insertion of the um, regular insertion sort. So a shell sort, if I had, let's say, maybe 40 items, like if I had, if I had you know, the, something that was in order by the, the name of the state in the United States for 50 items, don't know if a shell sort would be a gigantic advantage over an insertion sort. I would have to actually time it to figure out, well, which one's which, which one's better. That, it turns out, is what's going to happen um, here with our sorting assignment. So I may be able to talk about that. And what I'm going to do is, um, if I have time today, I'll start talking about the merge sort. And then we're going to talk about quick sort on Wednesday. But you now know what the insertion sort is and shell sort. And you can take the code directly from the book, by the way. Okay, I'm not going to ask you to reinvent that particular wheel since goodness knows computer science students have been reinventing it since like, what? At least 1970, as far as I can tell, if not, if, if not before then. And what we're going to do is we're going to obtain the execution time of the insertion, shell sort, merge, and quick sort for these input sizes. An array of 50,000, 100,000, all the way up to 300,000. And you're going to be timing them. Now we can use the timing code like we did in section 2.6. Remember how we had to do things with like um, running it 25 times and then take the last five runs and averaging those? I have not written the code myself, but I don't. Th I think we can dispense with that. I think we can do a simple timing because these arrays are large enough that I don't believe that the startup time for Java is going to be the issue here. I think it's going to be overwhelmed by the amount of stuff that we're actually doing inside of the sorts. What I want to do, though, is I want to give you sort of a framework for what's going to happen. I'm going to give you some pseudocode here, I think. So the pseudocode is going to get this. What we really want is something called a method called timing test. And we're going to give it an integer array of data. We don't even need to do that. We're going to have to give it an integer of the number of items to sort. And we also want to have an integer called um, sort method. 
So I will have something, for example, final static int um, insertion equals zero, final static int shell equals one, final static int uh, merge is two, and fun. Um, quick sort is. And then somewhere here in main, I can say, um, Now, the next question here is, do I want to use the same array on all of those or a different array on all of those? You know, in this case, I might want to use the same array on all, all, all four methods. Yeah. So, okay, change of plans. So we're going to have, um, and this can be void, I guess. Um, now, so this, the idea here is, is going to return the, um, amount of time required to sort the data by the given method. I am doing this on the fly. I'm designing this and talking my way through it. And it's fine. This is this is the way a lot of people program. They say, okay, well, what do I have to do? I'm going to do this rather than having four separate timing functions for each one of my uh, uh, methods. I'm going to have one method that does timing. I'm going to tell inside of it which method I want to use. So effectively, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, set the start time to now, whatever now is. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a switch on my sort method. So case insertion, I'll call insertion sort of data. Case um, shell, I'll do a shell sort of data. And then set elapsed time to current time minus start time, and then return the elapsed time. That way, I have only one method that I need to write to do the the, the, the actual portion that does the timing has to be written only once. And that also means I do not, and the, the, there's another reason I'm doing this because what some people might do is, oh, I'll take the insertion code and then I'll put the timing inside the sort. No, that is absolutely not what you want to do. You do not want to put the timing code inside of sort. Sort should just do sorting. That's all it does. This is one of the things, it's the Unix philosophy, which is, yeah. let me just put a comment here. So the timing code is independent sorting code. Sort should be. So things that are written in Unix have that philosophy, do one thing and do it well. And then I can put those together as building blocks into something bigger. Uh, I'm going to put this here as a pseudocode. Six um, sample files. If you are feeling especially brave, rather than doing a switch, you could also use higher order functions. Instead of passing on a method number here and using a switch statement, you could pass on a reference to the function, the, the sorting method itself. You might want to do that. I don't know. 
it's, it's a thought. But since everybody is more familiar with the switch statement, I think we'll stick with that for right now. Now, the question is, well, what if I did want to do something, you know, and I want, okay, here I have this wonderful, yeah, okay, I'm going to do merge sort tomorrow, on Wednesday, rather. I've just decided that I'm going to have to because I've only got about five more minutes. But let's talk about this. This is sort of interesting. Let's say I've got this pseudocode here and I've got it working. And now I want to try something different, but I don't want to lose my original code. Well, it turns out that, okay, first of all, I could copy it into another file. But then I've got a million different files with a million different names and it's really sort of ugly. What I'd like to be able to do is I'd like to be able to take this code that I have here and modify it without losing my original. And I'm going to tell you about the existence of this marvelous little tool called Git. And um, it is something called a version control system. Have I talked about this before? Okay, there's this is it's, it's not the very first and greatest one. There's also something called uh, CVS, which is not the drugstore. It's called concurrent versioning system. There's also one called uh, Mercurial, which is another versioning system. Essentially, what it does is you can have many different versions of your program, and it keeps track of all of them. And then you can take things that other people have contributed, and you can merge them together with your program. So you can have a lot of people collaborating on a project, and it all just fits together. So what I would do here is I would go into my... Um, what the heck am I doing? This example files, uh, 29. And in fact, I don't know if I have. Okay, good. I don't have anything um, called git in here. So I'm going to say git init, which is going to initialize a git thingy here. And now I've got a repository. That's what they're called. They're not called thingies. They're called repositories. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going, and I'm not going to give you a full blown explanation of Git, but it's something that if you're going to become a professional developer, you'll want to know how to use these versioning systems. It's really cool. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add sorting pseudocode.java and saying, I want this to be something that I'm going to stage for changes. And if I look at Git status, it'll say, okay, congratulations, you have this new file that's has not been committed yet. You haven't made any commitment to make these changes. And here are some things that you are not looking at. They're not tracked, but that's okay. I don't want to track them at the moment. And now I'm going to do a say git commit. And it says, here's the new file that's going in there, sorting pseudocode.java. And what I'm going to have here is I'm going to say, in general, what I would do here is I say, First commit. And I save that file. And now it says there's one file change and there are 32 insertions. Okay, cool. Now, what I can now say is, what branch am I on? And I'm on the main branch. Well, I want to make this functional. And so I'm going to make a new branch. I'm going to say, let's make a new branch called um, functional. And now if I look at what branches I have, I have functional and main. I can say, okay, now I want to switch over to the functional branch where I can do all my changes and I'm not screw around with what's in main because I'm happy with main. And then I'm going to say, git switch to functional. And now I'm switched to that new branch. And if I come here, what I can now, I can have here, um, I have to look it up again. I can't believe I forgot how to do this, but okay. Um, functions besides predicates. Okay. There's the function class. I'm not going to go into a great deal of 
stuff on that right now. Let me just say I'm going to change it. So, so essentially, I would have something like a function. Um, And then I'd call insertion sort. This is probably not even good Java, but it's, it's, it's pseudocode, so I don't really care. And then I'd have shell function of where I'd call shell sort of data. And then here I would have a function called which sort I'm going to use. Then I'm going to say, which sort of data. And then here in main, I would have something like create the data array of length 10,000 or whatever. I think it was 100,000. I don't know what the first one was. Um, and then I'm going to say um, elapsed, let's say insert is going to be timing test of data, and I'm going to call the um, insert function. The lapse time for shell will become the timing test for the data um, with the shell function, rather than having to use these static integers. So I can plan, do all of my planning, and let's say I do a whole bunch of writing on this. And let's save that. Now, if I come back here and I look at my status, it says, okay, you've modified sort of sorting pseudocode.java. Okay, cool. That means I want to say git commit and I'll commit everything that's been changed. And I'm going to say um, start adding higher order functions. So I make a little comment there that says, here's what I've done in this latest commit. Yeah. And you notice I'm still on the functional branch. Now I do this for a while and I figure out, oh gosh, you know, this, this was this was really a bad idea. I, I really should never have done this. I'm gonna stick with switch statement. No problem. I will now say, let's get switch back to main. I've switched back to main. And when I come back here into the editor, it says, okay, reload the file. And everything's back to the way it was before. So I can switch between these branches and try things out. And it doesn't matter if it doesn't work. If it does work, cool, I'll merge it back in. If it doesn't work, I'll just delete the new branch and stay with my old one. So this is something called Git. It's truly, it truly saves you a lot of time rather than having to make whole bunches of copies of all your files and keep track of which ones were modified when. Git's taking care of all of that for you. Um, I don't expect you to use this, okay? You, but I, I, I would encourage you to learn about it if you're going to be doing any large project because it becomes, again, really useful to keep track of what you're doing, being able to make changes. And also, I think the best part is you don't have to worry about making changes. I say, okay, I'm going you know, to try something new and entirely different, but I don't care if it doesn't work. I can always go back to my main branch and everything will still work. Yes, yeah, so I just want to let you know about this. Um, and we are on break time and lab time. And on Wednesday, I'll talk about merge sort and I'll talk about quick sort. Yeah, but I did want to give you the pseudocode, at least for the assignment. So you could even start working on that now, I guess, if you really wanted to. And that's it. Professor, do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I just want to say that Git is really useful. And I just want to mention that it's not just for Java, for any kind of reports, anything will work there too. So don't feel that it's just for Java, you know, for my, you know, high tech career, I've always used Git. It's extremely useful. Um, learn about it. So that's it. Yeah, that's right. It works for every language. Okay. So if you have a Python. Any file. Any hmm? file. So any any file. file. <laughs> yep. So even if you have like a spreadsheet, you could open up a Git branch and now doing a merge on that would be <laughs> pretty ugly. 
but um, at least keeping track of what version you're on, it's great for that kind of thing. Okay, so I will stop sharing and stop recording.